Hi all, we talked about the independence of events last time. Today, the topic of discussion is going to be independence of random variables. But before we start that, just a recap. Remember, if A and B are two events, then we call them to be independent if this equation turns out to be true. This we made as the defining definition for the concept of independence. This is something which we have seen multiple times. Last time we saw that we can extend this definition even to the case when we have family of events. If you remember this notation, this basically means that we have lot of events whose index is denoted by i which is coming from some set. In this case, this is ai where i is coming from 1 to up to n. In this case, we were able to define two kind of independences. First one was the simpler one which was called pairwise independence. In this case, the probability of p a a i intersection a j was the product of the two. The other way to say it is that if I take any two events out of these family of events, they turn out to be independent. So every pair of events is independent, then they are called pairwise independent. We also studied another definition which we called mutually independent. And this was in this case for all possible subsets of the index set i. So in that case, we say that if we pick capital J, which is a subset of the index set, then this probability is product of the individual probabilities. I should say Aj here. And this holds for all subsets of the index set. This is the definition of mutually independent. And when you look at it for the first time, you might say that, oh, these both might be equivalent. What we saw last time was that mutual independence implied pairwise independence. But on the other hand, the opposite direction was not true. Pause the video. Think about this statement for a while. What does this implications mean? Let's move on. Let's talk about random variables and their independence. Can we define the independence of random variables similar to how we have defined the independence of events? First thing, we will remember that our real valued random variables are a function from the sample space to real numbers. There might be cases, actually in this lecture, we are going to see some case when this will not be a real value random variable, but mostly we talk about real value random variable. In this case, we defined events x is equal to x. So a random variable could be thought of as a collection of these events. What was this event? This event was this set, which was a summation. Uh, subset of sample space. Remember, this is the set of all omegas such that x of omega is equal to x. This is coming from the sample space. Once I have view my random variable as collection of these events, then I can directly extend the definition of independence. So two random variables are independent if all possible events of x and y are independent. What does it mean? Probability of x equal to x and y is equal to y. This is probability of x is equal to x multiplied by probability of y equal to y. Remember, this has to hold true for all x comma y coming from range of x and y. If this happens, then we say that these two random variables x and y are independent. 
if we extended the definition to two random variables, why can't we extend it to a family of random variables? It is going to be very, very similar. We can say what a pairwise independent random variables are. In this case, if we pick any two random variables from my family, they should be independent. And this will happen for all i, j, that means all pair of random variables and all xi's which are coming from range of the random variable xi and xj which is coming from the range of random variable xj. Now you can actually try to write out the definition of mutual independence on your own. If you have written it out, you can check that it should look like this. Now you will pick a subset of the index set i and then if you look at this intersection probability, this should just be a multiplication of the corresponding index. Important thing for what it is, is it true? You pick any subset of the index set and xj's are coming from the range of random variable xj's and then we are in this case, again, we see that mutual independence implies pairwise independence. That means if a family of events or random variables are mutually independent, they are, they are pairwise independent. If a family of events are pairwise independent, we can't say they are mutually independent. As an exercise, try to come up with a concrete example of this. Remember, we constructed events which were pairwise independent but not mutually independent. So, just take those events, convert them into random variables with 0, 0,1 output and you should be able to construct an example. But I leave it as an exercise. Let us look at the importance of this notion of pairwise independence and mutual independence. We will look at a task which is called hashing in computer science and you might have seen it in your algorithms course. Why do you want to do hashing? Suppose you want to store a data stream. That means data is coming to you one by one and you want to store it in as less a space as possible. The problem is that the data or I should say every entry of data is coming from a big set. If that is the case, then to represent every element, I need this much space. And if there are, let's say, t elements which come to me in the data stream, then I need this much space. But again, because s is big, this might be too big. What can we do in this case? We might assume that t is much, much smaller than cardinality of s. So we get like 20 entries, but the, every entry can come from a set of, let's say, 1000, 10,000 numbers or something. If that is the case, it might not be too hard to believe that, let's say, the last four digits of the number are sufficient to store. What I am trying to say is that that will uniquely tell me what number is coming, right? So I will not have full information, but at least I will know what are the last four digits. It's, it's, it seems very, very unlikely that if I only pick 10 or 20 numbers out of 1 to 10,000, two of them are going to have same last four digits. In general, this is the idea of hashing. Let's make the idea concrete. What we are going to do here is to choose another set T with the property that cardinality of S is much, much bigger than cardinality of T. In other words, to store an element of T, you need only a small space. Log T is small. And now we define a function from S to T. Instead of storing S, we store just f of s. 
this might be a strategy to store things succinct. We would hope that the number of collisions in this case are pretty small. In other words, we will hardly get SNS prime such that Fs is equal to Fs prime. Notice that cardinality of S is very big as compared to cardinality of T. So there has to be elements where collision happens. We hope that in our data stream, this doesn't happen. It's a randomized hashing. In this case, we are given a set R also. And in some sense, we are going to have now these many hashings. What does it mean? Formally, for every R element of R in this set, I am going to define a function from S to T. So, every small r gives me a normal hashing as we talked about previously. But now, we have cardinality of r many hashings. And we basically pick one of these hashings randomly. You can say uniformly from this set r. Again, we will hope that the expected number of collisions are small. Remember, we are picking a small r randomly and according to that r, we are going to hash now. So, expected number of collisions instead of number of collisions are small. We are worried about the expected number now. Also, we would like to say that phi r s for a fixed s is uniformly distributed in the sense that if I fix an S and it, it's, look at its image for different R, they should go to different T's. Let's make it more formal. We are given three sets R, S and T and a randomized hashing over R from S to T is a collection of functions. Where are the functions from? Let's name them. We will call these functions, they are indexed by R and they go from set S to set T. This is how a randomized hashing is defined and this is for every R element of R. To analyze such a hashing, we will take help from a random variable or a collection of random variables. We will define for all S in capital S, these are the uh, elements in our domain which needs to be mapped. For each of these elements, we will look at where they go under the action of this hashing. So you see that I have replaced it by capital R. So there is a random variable which is a map from R to T. If I give it R, then I get phi R. This is how I am defining the random variable. You might have a question here. Is phi R S a real valued random variable? But notice that in this case, the random variable is denoted by a capital R. This is a function value. This is a function. And this is a random variable. Now, if we want our hashing to be useful or good, it should satisfy certain properties. Let's try to characterize when is your hashing good. One thing is, if we fix S, then for a random R, the image is distributed uniformly in T. Right? It should not happen that whatever small R I take, phi R S is always the same element. That would be a bad hashing. Then I am not using my randomness at all. Second thing, the number of collisions should be small. What does it mean? If I know what is my 
phi r s, the random variable phi r s, this is for some particular small s, then this should not give me any information about the other random variable. What is the random variable? Phi r s prime. Once again, looking at this statement, if you have two different inputs s and s prime, the hashing of one should not give me any information about the hashing of the other. This is the intuitive sense and we can actually make it very, very precise. Such a useful or a good hashing, we call it pairwise independent. So hashing is called pairwise independent if it satisfies two properties. The first property which is that phi r s, again this is a random variable, is uniformly distributed. This is equivalent to the first step here and second should remind you of pairwise independence, that is why the name is also there. It basically says that your random variable, again it is indexed by inputs. This family of events is pairwise independent. Then the hashing is called pairwise independent. It turns out that both of these conditions can be thought of as equivalent to this condition. So you will see that this condition actually looks very much like the condition for pairwise hashing. This happens for all s comma s prime element of s. Remember s should not be equal to s prime but t and t prime element of t. Here there is no condition between t and t prime. This is what we want. Why is this pairwise independence? This is because you can calculate this probability from the one above. What do you think this probability should be from 1? That is the question and if you answer that then you will see that this equation is exactly pairwise independence. Funny thing is that condition 3 also implies 1. So it implies 1 and 2 both. 3 seems to be equivalent to 2 but it actually also implies that phi rs is uniformly distributed. And this nice condition actually tells you a lot. Let me just write it again. The probability that phi r s s goes to t under this mapping and s prime goes to t prime is independent. And this happens for all s comma s prime such that s is not equal to s prime and t comma t prime empty, right? So that's just this condition itself implies phi r s does not tell us anything about the other mapping. What is the other mapping? Phi r s prime. Again, s should not be equal to s prime. The number of collisions are small. The probability is only 1 by t square. That's the smallest possible. And third, that phi r s is uniformly distributed. We got to see that if a randomized hashing is pairwise independent, which was defined like this, then it satisfies all these three properties. We will see an application of this in the next class.